Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Understanding Macro Quality Payment Program using MIPS scores to inform improvement interventions conference call. I will now turn the call over to Candy Hansen. Ms. Hansen, you may begin. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. We're very excited to have this opportunity today to offer this webinar to you. Um, before we get started, um, I want to just address a few housekeeping items. Those of you who registered before today should have received a reminder this, uh, that included a link to the webinar event page where you can find the handouts for today's presentation. Uh, we also posted a link um, in the chat uh, function. A recording of today's webinar will be made available in a couple of weeks. You'll be able to find a direct link to that recording from the LS Quinn event page. We do encourage you to ask questions throughout the presentation utilizing the chat function. Um, we're going to have a set-aside time for questions later on in the presentation, so we'll try to attend to them as we can, um, but we may just delay that because of the um, amount of information we have to give to you today. Um, we're also going to have two polling questions um, in today's presentation, so we'll appreciate your responses. And finally, when you close out of today's webinar, you'll automatically be redirected to a short evaluation. We greatly appreciate you taking a few minutes to provide us with the feedback, which we will use to inform the remainder of our webinars, as well as other educational offerings. And then upon completing the evaluation, you'll receive a certificate of attendance for your record. So I'm Candy Hansen, and I am a nurse by background. I'm a program manager with Stratus Health, and I am one of several uh, subject matter experts in the, uh, for the quality payment program um, with our LS Quinn. Lisa, do you want to introduce yourself? Good morning. Or good, it is still morning in some places. Good morning, everyone who's there. Um, I'm Lisa Gall. I'm a nurse practitioner by background, a nurse for 30 years, and I um, am a clinical program manager at Stratus Health, and we're happy to present our um, program to you today. Okay, let's go ahead. Next slide, please. Because the information uh, we continue to provide to you does and can change as we reinterpret the final rule and we get more information from CMS, uh, we've just added this disclaimer to our webinars. Specifically, we really encourage you to visit the resource page of the Quality Payment Program website often. Uh, they're updating information on an ongoing basis, and um, it just seems like every time we go in there, they've posted something new or something to clarify something in the Quality Payment Program. Next slide. So in case you didn't know who the Lake Superior Innovation Network is, we are the three quality and improvement organizations of MPRO in Michigan. Stratus Health in Minnesota, and Metastar in Wisconsin. Uh, we work in collaboration to improve health care for Medicare consumers, share best practices, and maximize efficiencies across the three states. Our objectives for today are to understand your 2017 MIPS score and how your current activities have an impact on your MIPS score, learn how to use your MIPS score to identify areas uh, of opportunity for improvement, and to identify interventions and strategies to improve overall quality and increase your MIPS scores. We're not going to spend a lot of time today uh, deep in the details of the quality payment program because we have so much other information to present, but all of our previous webinars that have gone into much more detail are recorded and are posted on our LS Quinn website under the events tab. And again, uh, this recording will also be posted up there in a couple of weeks. Before we do a quick overview of the quality payment program, uh, Emily, we wanted to, do, to pull the audience. Um, what we would like to know is, um, as you perceive your level of understanding of the quality payment program, we would like to know how you do perceive your understanding. So if you would uh, participate in the poll, um, don't be hesitant to be honest in your perception. Uh, this is going to help us plan for other regional events as well. So we'll have this open for 30 seconds. Uh, so do you have very little understanding, some understanding, a moderate degree of understanding, or do you feel like you have an advanced understanding? Do we have the responses? Okay. So 
it'll just take up just a couple more seconds. There we go. Okay, so what do we see? Very little understanding. A few people are saying some understanding. Um, a moderate degree of understanding, and then there's a few that say that they have uh, advanced understanding. So thank you for your response for this. And the majority um, are falling in the some and moderate. Yep, yep, which is a good thing. That's that's where we really want people to be right now. So, okay. So in the quality payment program, there are two tracks for eligible clinicians. The first path being the advanced alternative payment model path. And CMS is expecting only about 7 or 8% of clinicians to fall into this category for the 2017 transition year. If you are a qualified professional in an advanced alternative payment model, you are eligible for a 5% Medicare fee-for-service bonus for the next five years. The second path that CMS is expecting 90% or more of its clinicians to be eligible for in this transition year is the Merit-Based Incentive Payment System, or MIPS. If you are a MIPS-eligible clinician, you are eligible for a positive or negative payment adjustment that is budget-neutral. In addition to that, if your score, your composite score of 0 to 100 is 70 and above, you will also be eligible for a portion of the $500 million exceptional care bonus payment that has been set aside for the next several years. Now, Lisa's going to go into just a little more detail about each of the two paths. Lisa? Thanks, Candy. So as, as Candy said, the first path of the quality payment program is, is joining an advanced APM, or alternative payment model. The goal for advanced APMs is to move away from traditional Medicare Part B fee-based services in order to promote quality over volume. Shown in the larger dark blue circle, an alternative payment model provides higher incentive payments for high quality and cost efficient care. Alternative payment models can apply to a specific clinical condition, a care episode, or a population. Other payers besides Medicare are also adopting this care model. Advanced APMs are a subset of APMs specific to Medicare Part B clinician services that allow practices to earn more for taking on some risk related to their patient outcomes, and they're shown in the light blue middle circle. If you see less than 25% of your billed Medicare services and see less than 20% of your Medicare patients under that advanced APM, you do not qualify for the 5% payment adjustment. However, you can choose to participate under the MIPS program to receive a positive payment adjustment. The list Shown here are those CMS advanced APMs that qualify for special scoring as a MIPS APM, along with those APMs that don't have a two-sided risk factor. Next page. The second path of the quality payment program is the Merit-Based Incentive Payment System, or MIPS. CMS has combined previous legacy programs of PQRS, the EHR incentive payment system and value-based modifier into one program. They've renamed them and added a new category of improvement activities. As this screen shows, the four categories of MIPS each contribute a certain weight to your MIPS score. Your maximum MIPS composite score on the right is 100, <clears throat> and it's based on the performance here and impacts your payment two years later for your Medicare Part B fee for services. So as you can see, quality accounts for 60% of the MIPS score, previously PQRS. Advancing care information accounts for 25% of your score, previously the EHR incentive payment program. And the new category of improvement activities accounts for 15% of your score. Cost accounts for 0% of your score this year, but will be phased in in future years. So the advancing care information um, shows uh, replaces meaningful use um, and has a whole different approach than the EHR um, incentive program in that it no longer is an all or none, and you can score up to 100 of a possible 155 points to get full credit. You must meet four or five of the base measures, depending on which um, certified EHR you are using, to co in order to score any points at all in this category and um, meet the base measures, providing you with 50 points. The remaining measures are scored on performance, but are not mandatory to meet. 
to score in this category. Bonus points are also available. And ca the category can be reweighted to quality if you meet the exemption. For example, those who were not required to report last year for EHR um, incentive payment, or if you apply for and CMS approves a hardship, hardship exemption for this category. Next slide. On this slide, um, you'll see that quality makes up 60% of your MIPS score, and it can be up to 85% if you have your advancing care information category reweighed. If you use claims, EHR, qualified registry, or qualified clinical data registry, you report up to six quality measures for at least 90 days in the transition year, or use measures from a specialty set. Each method has different benchmarks. The CMS web interface is for groups of over 25, and you report to 14 quality measures. Um, alternative payment models report quality as a group via the web interface. So the new MIPS category is improvement activities designed to prepare individuals for advanced APMs and APMs, and for medical home models. So in, in order to um, for full points in this, you, it depends on what setting you are in. You do get double points if you are in a small rural or underserved area or are a non-patient facing clinician. Uh, the medium activities are worth 10 points and the high activities are worth 20 points. Next. Cost is not scored in 2017 and will be phased in in either 2018 or 2019 depending on the final rule. There is no data submission for cost. It's calculated automatically from adjudicated Part B claims. And before we begin um, the MIP scoring portion, we would like to ask you about your participation in the quality payment program. So please answer whether you are planning to participate in the merit-based incentive payment system, or um, you think you are in a MIPS APM, or advanced alternative payment model like Next Generation ACO or MSFP. Emily, you can open the polling now. Thank you. Number four is unsure. We have a slight pause while you are answering, responding to these questions. Again, and it's okay to say unsure if you don't know yet. We are. Are you MIPS? Are you MIPS APM? Are you part of an um, advanced APM? Or are you unsure? Okay. So the poll has ended. We'll have about 20 seconds here to have those polls calculating in. We're just waiting for the results of the poll. They should be showing up in just a couple of seconds here. Why don't we just go on to so the we're gonna, we're gonna, and we'll We're going to come back to this question. Um, we're going to talk about NIP scoring and um, until we get a result on this. Um, the pick your pace option, well, we're going to talk about MIPS scoring. And so the pick your pace option, um, CMS realizes that the simplified reporting methods are not so simple. And therefore, they're allowing clinicians a pick your pace option in 2017. Um, the first method, is, number one in the, in the blue, is test. You submit something from one or more categories for at least 90 days, um, and like one improvement activity or one quality measure, 
And if you use the partial method, you can su you submit um, data for all three categories for at least 90 days um, to earn a small or neutral positive uh, neutral or small positive payment adjustment. And for the full method, you submit to all three categories for a full year. And you may do well in the full reporting year method. You may have more um, measures to choose from, which reach over 90 days. Um, but you can also score very well in the partial method. Um, what you don't want to do is not participate in the quality payment program. It's really, I've heard some people say it's not an option because it's so easy to do a test to submit something. Those are who are in an advanced APM um, and qualified participant in advanced APM have no MIPS requirements. And we have the results of the poll, um, as we thought. Uh, most people will be participating in uh, merit-based incentive payment uh, system, either uh, as a MIPS clinician or a MIPS APM. 12% um, say that they are participating as an advanced alternative payment model, and 11 folks, uh, 11 out of our participants said that they weren't sure. So, okay. This is we expect. Um, so that that um, kind of solidifies where we think people will be in 2017 with payment year of 2019. This um, slide is the MIPS 2017 transition year slide, and it just shows in a scale. Um, if you do nothing and you get zero points and you get that payment adjustment, the three points brings you to a neutral or possibly slightly positive payment adjustment. Um, and then the 4 to 69 percent um, points will bring you into, um, I'm sorry, the three points will give you a neutral payment adjustment. I said that backwards. And the 4 to 69 points will give you a slightly positive payment adjustment this year. There is no exceptional performance bonus payment and no negative payment adjustment um, in this cat point. And over 70 points. Well, are, you are eligible for a positive payment adjustment and exceptional performance bonus payment if you have over 70 points in your MIPS score. So really, it's, it's easy to avoid a negative payment adjustment in 2017. Um, you just need to report at least one category for at least 90 days, and you know basically it can be from any of these three categories four or five uh, required base objectives for the advancing care information category. And then quality, uh, there are 271 NIPS approved measures. Um, and groups using GPRO would have to report to the whole 14 measures. Um, and then improvement activities, you choose from 92 care-related activities that are rated either medium or high. And we talked before about double points for being small and, and for practices over 15. Um, need two medium or one high activity, and if you are a medical home model or MIPS APM, you receive full credit in this category. Okay. So as many of you know, um, Stratus Health has developed a free tool um, called the MIPS Estimator to help you determine your baseline MIPS score and then, understa and then understand and use the tool to help you um, understand and, and understand your score throughout the year and plan your improvement activities around that. Um, it's been available for a while as an Excel file in the pre-release version. It can be downloaded off the Stratus Health website. Um, but we've also been building it out in an on, as an online application, and that version will be out very soon. We wanted to give you a quick preview of what it will look like, because the look is very different than the Excel version. We're very excited to be able to offer this as an online application. It will be much easier to use and to view, and we're confident you're going to love it. So this is part, uh, these are all screenshots, um, obviously, from um, the online tool. This is a part of the home page. You would, as you can see, you can see the categories going across the top, uh, as well as a place to see your score as you keep moving through the tool. And that is in that green uh, tab that is the last tab on the end of uh, this call or that row. And I know these next slides are just a little hard to see, but we just wanted to give you an idea of how the look will be much different than it currently is in our MIPS estimator and the Excel, as an Excel version. So just as you do now, you'll start by entering your practice or provider information. This sets up the back end um, to do your calculations, and it will just be much easier to see and to respond to. 
The next slide is just page two of the practice provider information. You can see it's asking about the settings that you're in, if you're a primary um, care uh, medical home model, um, if you are planning to do 2014-2015 CERT, how you're planning to report for 2017. So the same questions that we have in the Excel version just put into a different format. The next slide is a screenshot, so we've split the screen, so um, it's just a screenshot of the Advancing Care Information page. As you can see, you'll be entering in your numerators and denominators. Um, the, the measures and objectives are explained for each of these uh, in the Advancing Care Information category, um, and then they're scored. Uh, your score, then again, you'll see at the top right-hand corner. The next one is the Quality Measures page. Um, again, asking you the same questions so that you're aware of the data completeness threshold, which we'll be talking more about in just a minute. If you're reporting using uh, end-to-end CERT, for which you receive bonus points, um, so that's what that looks like. And here's a screenshot of the Improvement Activities page. This just has highlighted two activities. Um, and then again, if you're using CERT to do that activity, if it's, if it's one of those 18 activities that gets bonus points so that it will carry over into the ACI page. And finally, the um, scoring dashboards. Um, you'll get a quick visual that includes what your score would have been with other reporting strategies, as well as an option for a more detailed report. We're just finishing up the alpha testing, and we are expecting this tool to be released in the next several weeks. Um, but if you would like to be notified, we will at, um, at some time in the near future be doing uh, white, more widespread uh, publication of this. But for those folks that have already signed up for the MIPS estimator, and if you haven't but, and would like to be a part of the uh, first group of folks to be notified that it's available as an online tool, if you go to the Stratus Health website and you click on um, the MIPS estimator page, you just fill out a few demographic questions and we will be notifying that group of people uh, via email. So um, that's just a quick view of our uh, MIPS estimator as an online version, and we're really excited to have it come out. Lisa? Okay, so now we, we want you to understand how you can translate your MIPS score into an action plan for improvement. and. What do you do to succeed? Um, and really, this isn't about so much about your MIPS score. Although we talk a lot about MIPS score, it's really about how you're doing overall in quality and, you know, improving quality and controlling costs and um, helping your patients to have better outcomes. So really, the meat of our webinar is really about how to get, gather data to enter into the MIPS estimator or another tool if you have another tool option for you and then to obtain a, a score, your MIPS score. Third, we want you to analyze and validate that data and to make sure that it's looking correctly. You don't just put in numbers and uh, believe the numbers. You really need to validate that they're correct. You know, are your numbers correct from your end? Did you enter the right things in? Um, and, you know, do they look correct in what your EHR or your vendor's um, output is? You know, so validate that in many multiple ways. Then we want you to use this tool to compare to the benchmarks that are um, set by uh, CMS um, or other benchmarks, and then have an improvement plan, which involves plan, do, study, act cycles. And those in quality improvement are very familiar with this, the PDSA cycles. So you identify and prioritize the areas for improvement. Um, then you develop an improvement plan. You implement your workflows so that um, you can, you know, get to a quality improvement. After you implement your workflows, you monitor and you reevaluate. So when you sign up for the MIPS estimator, you'll receive both the data sheet and the calculator at this time, and this is our, our current um, data sheet. Um, to allow you to get to uh, get the data that you need to enter into the estimator. So it, it, it provides um, you a place to enter your numbers so that when you, you know, get to the online tool or Excel tool, you can enter them quickly. Um, don't, uh, if you get the data sheet, it is not the calculator. You, you need to be aware this is just only for your purposes to um, gather it. And also, um, if you do use the data sheet, as you can see, we have circled in the upper left-hand corner and, and the bottom of the page. 
2014 CERT and 2015 CERT. We have a, a data sheet for each one acknowledging that for 2015 CERT, the ACI measures and objectives changed slightly. Yes. Okay, and then the next page shows, um, you know, this is an example of the quality score in your MIPS estimator in the Excel tool. So this one shows that the base quality score, um, they received 26 points. Um, based on how they did on the six measures that were submitted. And the total bonus points they received were eight um, points. And your total quality score then was 34 out of 60 possible points. So this is your first opportunity for improvement. You can see you've got 34 and you have a maximum possible of 60. So that this should start to get you thinking of, hmm, why was it, why was our, maybe 34 is okay for you. But if it's not okay for you, you know, start thinking about, well, how do I dig down and figure out which scores impacted my, uh, or, or which measures impacted my score the most? So then you do want to drill down into the next slide, please, um, and analyze and validate the data. So this slide um, on the advancing care information entry page um, shows that, yes, they did um, provide a security risk analysis. Security risk analysis. I couldn't even read that online. Yep. I'm sorry. That's the top one. You will not receive a score if you did not do a security risk analysis. And just remember that that's one of the most common failures of an audit in the um, EHR incentive program is fail saying yes to this without actually completing it. So this is an attestation measure or objective that you say yes or no to. And so if you do not do it, um, you know, then you know you receive zero in that category, but you should probably think about how you're going to complete that security risk analysis if you have not completed one this year yet. Um, but anything else on that, Candy? Well, and I think just really paying attention to, you'll see in the MIPS estimator it says in that first column, is this required for the base score? If it says yes, again, you need to have something, you need to have answered all of those questions in order to receive the, the base score of 50% of your ACI uh, MIPS score. Right. There's, there's four required base measures in the 2014 CERT and five required base measures in the 2015 CERT. Now, the ones with numerators and denominators need to have at least one in the numerator. Um, there's an exception for those who are not prescribing for less than 100 prescriptions in, in the reporting period. If they have zero in the numerator and zero in the denominator, they can bypass that um, requirement. And there is um, some proposed language in the next rule that hits and impacts those with less than 100 transitions of care for the uh, sending a summary of care. That is, at this point, is required to have one in that numerator, um, at least one, either for individuals or a group. Um, and if you don't have, if you have less than 100, you may qualify for an exception for that particular measure. And for the less than 100, um, if they have a null value or a zero in their numerator and denominator, don't they also have to attest? They, yes, they have to attest that they actually have zero and, and there's a couple extra questions when, questions when you do an attestation. And we don't know what that's going to look like yet. We are being told um, towards the end of the year or the beginning of next year, we'll get more information about what that attestation actually is going to look like for 2017. We do have one question in the chat box specifically specific to the security risk analysis, wondering can you answer yes to the security risk analysis if it was done in a prior year to 2017? It must be done in the year that you report. In the performance year. In the year. performance year. Yeah. And it should be done annually or with any upgrades to your EHR or major changes in your system. Um, I'm going to move on to the next part of the panel. Whoops. Let's go oh, back up. That's quick. Oh, that's right. Okay. I'm sorry, Anna. Okay. <laughs> One more slide, please. Oh, sorry. That was ours. So um, the analyzing um, and validating data, if you do respond to, yep, can you make this a little bigger? Yep, she's doing that. I just asked her to do that. Okay. So this is um, your quality measures. Okay, so this is quality measures. And so in this example, you have the breast cancer screenings um, and with quality. There's some requirements when you 
you know, not just your numerators and denominators, but you need to meet um, the base, the case minimum requirement of 20 cases. Um, and Which is calculated automatically based on your numerator and your denominator. Yes. Yep. And then, Anna, if you can slide, slide that over a little bit so we can see the red bars there. Perfect. Oh, and then in the two green uh, rows, we're, um, you're validating whether but whether or not you uh, meet the 50% data uh, completeness threshold. Oh, in the first column. Yep. So you can see in the first example that they said, yes, they completed it. And um, in the second and third ones, they said no. So because they said no in the data completeness, that they did not include more than 50% of their patients in their numerators and denominators, that they only received, received the base score of three. And the one that answered yes to both questions. The second question is um, is whether you used a registry or if you're using an EHR registry or QCDR, did you report these measures end-to-end -end using certified EHR technology, which means no manual entry when you upload your data. Or no, man or no manual data extraction. Or no manual data extraction. And the reason we, we ask that question is because that makes you eligible for a bonus point if you did uh, report the measure using end-to-end -end cert. And there is a question in the chat specific to this. Are the eligible cases calculated on the denominator? Are the eligible? Oh, no, the eligible. Oh, oh, of the eligible cases. Yes. They are, the numerator is the 20. Yes. The numerator is, did it meet the threshold of 20 uh, of the eligible cases, which would be the denominator? Yes. Yes, that is correct. Okay, is that it for questions? All right. Okay. Next slide, please. So this um, slide, this provider only received three points, which is the base score. They reported... And in order to receive a base score, um, oh, we're on a different slide. Sorry, we're on slide 32. Just uh, for improvement activities. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Um, Got ahead of your head out here. Yeah. <laughs> Analyzing and so this is the improvement activities. A score for a patient-centered oh, medical home sorry. model because they were. There we go. Okay. The patient-centered medical home model. Um, will receive a full score of 40 points. However, in order to um, be eligible for the bonus points of 10% of your um, AC, in, in your ACI category, um, your EHR, Advancing Care Information category, you can get a bonus point um, of 10% of your score. If you report to a measure that qualifies that you did this activity using certified EHR technology to complete this activity. And there is a question in chat, I say, for IC, for those who fall between 4 and 69 points, will there be a difference in the positive payment adjustment received? For example, will a score of 25 receive a different payment adjustment than someone with a score of 65? And the answer is yes. Um, all the way up the continuum, the lower you are on the continuum, the lower your positive payment adjustment will be. The higher you are in the continuum, the higher your payment adjustment will be. However, in 2017, that's going to be pretty minimal because we don't anticipate a lot of people will be opting out and or not reporting because it's so easy this year because this is a budget neutral, um, uh, budget neutral program where the, the lower um, scoring performers pay the higher pay scoring performers. Okay. And Anna, can you um, zoom in a little bit on this? We thought it was important for you to see the benchmark, um, to see an example of how uh, measures are benchmarked. So, Lisa? So, in this um, example, we have the middle benchmark. The breast cancer screening um, can be reported by claims, by EHR, and by registry. So, this particular measure has um, the benchmarks that range under the EHR example from 12.41 up to 100%. However, if you score over 73.23%, then um, <clears throat> you will receive a score of 10. However, you look and compare that to the claims um, benchmarks. The claims benchmarks range from 48 
to 98.53 between the decile 3 and decile 10. And the breast, uh, the registry scores between 24, uh, 14.49 and 87.99. So it really depends. If you're scoring 40%, you're going to get in decile, um, 4 for claims, in decile 6 for EHR, and in decile 5 for registry. And if you really don't, you know, you don't need to dig deep into each benchmark, um, but we're just suggesting that um, one of the things that you can do is when you're looking, when you're using the MIPS estimator, you can click on um, claims, for example, and see how your score looks with the measures you've entered. It, there's also an option to print a report to see the other reporting strategies. That will give you an indication of how those measures have been benchmarked based on the score that it gives you for each reporting strategy. Yes, thank you, Candy. One more thing on this slide is that you can see that the provider um, for breast cancer screening did not meet the um, minimum um, case uh, of eligible cases greater than 50%, so they said no to that, and they only received the benchmark score of uh, the um, minimum score of three. Right, and so that's, that's an important thing to pay attention to because if you have a, a great, if you've reported really well in there, you want to make sure that you've met that data completeness threshold because if you didn't, you always will only get the, for this year, you'll only get the floor score of three points. We did have a question in the chat about where folks can find benchmark information. Oh, great question. If you go to the Quality Payment Program portal, so qppcms.gov, and you click on the far right-hand side of that page, um, you'll hover over it and, and there, you'll be offered two options. One of those options is, is called Resource. You click on the resource page, and in that resource page, after you scroll down about halfway through, you've gotten through proposed rule, final rule tab, you'll see where um, the 2017 benchmark, quality benchmark table is. So that's a great question. And so that not only do you want to have the benchmarks, you want to have the specifications for each of those quality measures because each specification may be different between your reporting methods. And where do they find the specifications, Lisa? And that is the same place. They are, it's called Quality Measure Specifications in the QPP um, resource area. Okay. Next slide. So, given um, the identifying and prior, one of the opportunities for improvement is to decide whether you will be providing numerators or denominators for each performance category. So that's a, that's a question. Do you report or do you not report? Just because you choose to enter in data into all of the categories doesn't guarantee that you will receive 25 points in that category. So there's been some instances where someone has performed very well in just a few of those categories um, in those um, measures and instances where someone has performed not so well but has put something in all of the performance categories and both have done equally well. So if you have a measure that you don't currently have data for, but you think it might be a possibility for any of your clinicians to have a numerator or denominator for, plug it that in what, to what you are thinking to see how it, how it could potentially change your score. One example is that you have zero, your, your, your EHR is telling you you have zero for, you know, one of those scores, and you know that you've sent summaries of care or that you've done e-prescribing, but um, you, you think that you're doing much better than that. This is just a, a this is not your next final score, this is an estimated score, and we maybe didn't say that clearly enough. This is just an estimation, that's why it's called the MIPS estimator, and it will, um, change based on your MIPS final score when that comes through CMS after they've gone through all of your data for the year. Um, when you plug that information in, plug in what you're thinking, then um, as, see how it could change your score, and then base your decision about whether you will go after that with your clinicians based on your potential score. If you're really close to getting to another level of a scoring, between, let's say you're scoring at 68 and you want to see if we can move up to this percentage and will it get us above the 70 points, um, that's a great place to do that. Yep. So next, consider registries. Um, in the ACI category, there are um, three possibilities for, for registries. There's the immunization registry, there's um, 
uh, well, there's syndromic surveillance, which isn't necessarily a registry, and then there's the public health registries. We do know in some states, um, and Minnesota is one of them currently, but there are limited uh, amounts of registries to be able to choose from. Um, but, you know, plug it in there. And based on how uh, they could impact your score, because they give you some nice bonus points if you're doing them, now might be the right time to have discussions with your state or others about what could be possible and when might they have other registries available to um, choose from. And as you look at measures that have the lowest scores, think about why that might be. Um, if you're looking at a measure score that's uh, lower than anticipated, are you certain that your EHR is pulling the data correctly? If not, speak to your EHR vendor and your IS support to, to make sure about that, that the data is um, validated. If that's not the issue, you, you may wish to interview clinical staff about what their perception is about why the score would be so low. Use what you learn to guide your action steps. We'll talk more in a minute about specific action ste steps for focusing in on a specific measure to improve. Print your ACI or quality page off and then change your numerator slightly to see the effect. Use those data reports to inform, inform your providers. They might be surprised to see how a moderate change to workflow might make a big difference. Ask for their input about how this might be achieved. Next slide, Lisa. Okay. So here's an example of some quality measures and how they are scored. There are several considerations for reporting quality measures. The first is measure type and high priority measure. Um, you are required to report one of your measures as a high priority measure. You'll see on our tool when you select a, a measure whether it is a high priority measure or not. Despite the number of measures you enter, CMS will, will automatically take the highest scoring six measures for the quality category. As will our tool. And our tool will. Even if you enter in, you know, 20 or 10 measures, if you enter in three, we're just going to pick the three is automatic, but we'll take the highest scoring. In addition, CMS will give you bonus points for all additional high priority measures. Again, pay attention to your numerators and denominators print or save the page with your real numbers, as Kenny said, then change them to see if it makes a difference. So each quality measure is eligible for up to 10 points per measure times six measures, which would equal 20, 60 points. In the 2017 transition year, CMS has established a three-point floor for all measures reported so even if you only choose to report one measure for 90 days, you will get that three points and avoid the negative payment adjustment. To qualify for more than a three-point floor, you need to pay attention to two more things when you're reporting quality. The first is that the measure must have a minimum of 20 eligible cases. And if you don't meet that criteria, you'll still receive the floor three points. Secondly, um, you need the data completeness threshold of 50% of eligible cases. And for claims, that means 50% of Medicare fee-for-service clients. And for all other reporting methods, methods, it's for all payers. If you don't meet those two criteria, you will receive the base three points. If your measure has topped out, that means for two consecutive years, a measure is topped out, you're likely to receive a three-point base score. So all of those things are just important to consider when you're um, looking at the MIPS estimator as a way to consider um, how you might improve. And now we're not going to take the deepest dive in, but we did want to spend a few minutes on how you might implement um, an improvement plan in a Plan, Do, Study, Act cycle. So you've played with the measures and objectives. You've decided to focus in on a specific measure. What's next? First, we recommend that you will concentrate on one measure at a time. A common mistake providers make is just taking on too much more than they actually have capacity to, to do. Change and improvement take time, and if they're rushed, as we all know, they're generally not sustained. So as those of you ha ha um, who have done improvement work, you'll quickly realize that work, workflow changes just around one measure, for example, will give you plenty of work to do. There are other models for improvement, but we will focus on the um, Plan, Do, Study, Act cycle model, or the PDSA. The Institute for Healthcare Improvement, IHI, uses this model for uh, improvement as the framework to guide, to guide improvement work. PDSA is designed to be a rapid cycle quality improvement activity. 
Consecutive PDSA cycles are trial, trials obtained on a sm small scale to collect information about the effectiveness of incremental changes. By working, in small, uh, by working small in terms of scope, the change can be managed. So, for example, if what is tried does not work as planned, you can always go back to the way things were done and try something different. And so in the plan, it's what exactly are we, what we, are we going to do. In the do part of the cycle, it's when and how did we do it. The study part says what were the results we achieved. And act is what changes are we going to make based on our findings. So thinking the PDSV model for improvement consists of two parts, thinking and doing. The thinking part consists of three fundamental questions for achieving improvement. What are you trying to accomplish? How will you know that change is an improvement? And what change can you make that will result in improvement? People tend to want to jump straight to the solution rather than working on the root of the problem. If you answer these three fundamental questions, it will help to ensure that you are dealing with the issues that need to be addressed. The questions also guide the work and lead to do, doing the action part of the PDSA. This improvement work is intended to be done as a group or a team discussion, not necessary, not as an individually, because the goal will need to be supported by the group, excuse me, to see the best results. The next thing you're going to want to do is develop your SMART aim or goal. So you start by defining what you're trying to accomplish. This is your aim statement or goal. The aim should be time specific and measurable. It should also define a specific population or system that will be affected. You will need to write a clear and concise goal for your improvement and identify the objectives in simple language that's easy to understand. A good way to determine if you have a clear and concise goal is to use the SMART acronym. Is the, is the goal specific, measurable, is it achievable, is it relevant, and is it time-bound? So this is just a template on how to develop a SMART aim or goal. So by when, who will be doing what to see what kind of change, a measure, and how will they be doing it. So let's take the example of um, choosing a, uh, the breast cancer measure to increase breast cancer screening rates. So let's say we want to increase the number of women over 50 who are screened for breast cancer from 49 to 53 percent by December 1st by sending annual reminder letters and providing education regarding the benefits of early detection. If you put that into an example, that this is how it's broken down. So the when by December 1st, 2017, the who and uh, what? The providers in Clinic A will see an increase in the number of women over 50 who are screened for breast cancer, and the measurement is from 49 to 53 percent. And how will they accomplish that? By sending annual reminder letters and providing education regarding the benefits of early detection. Measurement is fundamental to answering this question about um, whether or not you actually saw improvement. Without improvement, what, or without measurement, how do you know if the change has led to improvement? The next step will be to understand your workflow related to the intervention you're trying to, going to try out. This is currently done by process mapping the current state of the workflow as well as the future state of the workflow. While there are formalized process templates, process mapping templates, it can be as simple as gathering the group involved with the workflow and writing out every task in the workflow. From that uh, identified workflow, you identify gaps, you identify the future state workflow, and that's what you try out. So the first step in the PDSA cycle is plan. When developing a plan, your team should ask the following questions and record responses. What's the objective of the test? Here you should state what you want to accomplish by doing the test. Once you predict what will happen and state what you will happen as a result of your plan's action. What exactly will you do? Clearly define the tasks and activities that will be undertaken. Who will it involve? Will you start small with just one neighborhood department or one group of, of um, workers? Um, and how long will it take to implement? It's important to define a time period and make it as specific as possible. And consider the resources you will need. For example, you will need extra time, staff, equipment. Do you need data or information, et cetera? Think about all those things. So this next slide, then, is the template filled out. 
um, based on the goal, the SMART aim that we had set aside. So the change we are testing with the PDSA cycle is to see an increase in the number of women over 50 who are screened from breast cancer from 49 to 53 percent by December 1st by sending annual reminder letters and providing education. We predict that we will be successful because we have the support of leadership and the buy-in of all staff to work towards this goal. We will be testing this with all physicians and clinic aid for three months beginning September 1st. And the resources needed will be staff time, education, IT support for reminder letters, and that the QI director will run X reports, the identified reports from the EHR. The reports will show aggregate findings and others uh, will, re and also will re report by provider and will report back to the staff involved in the effort in monthly QI screening. The next step is do. This is actually where you're testing the change, and this is actually the fun part. It's important to do the activity and not get caught in the planning phase for too long. Again, implement the change on a small scale. When first using the PDSA cycle with a small project, um, you do it in a rel relatively short period of time. The first time you will likely discover changes you want to make on the next cycle. Next, carry out a test and work with whatever plan you have made. Document the problems and expectations um, along the way. And this will assist you in analyzing the cycle and avoiding problems in the future. Here you begin your analysis of your data as well. So this is what the do would look like for that measure. First test run was run from September to November. The workflow included medical assistance um, providing educational resources to all women over 50 in the clinic after the patient had checked in. An observation might be it might be more effective to provide the resource as the patient is being roamed. And um, just a comment that all three physicians were engaged during that PDSA, or I mean during the test. The third step, um, this is the time for reviewing your test of change. Use this phase to quantify and measure what has happened. Study the data and uh, collect it and think about its impacts. Think about what you could have done differently. Complete the analysis on the data. Think about where you were and compare that to now. Has it made a difference? Compare the data to your predictions. Did you, were you satisfied with the results? And then summarize and reflect on what was learned. And in the study part, um, overall, Clinic A achieved an increase to 52%, so they didn't make quite 53%, but they were pretty darn close. Two of the three of the physicians in Clinic A met or exceeded the goal from 49 to 53. Physician three did not meet the goal. Further workflow analysis is needed. Also learned in this that IT needs more lead time to be able to plan um, in their IT needs and their resources. And then the fourth study is ACT. This is when you need to think about the action that will be taken and what opportunities might have arisen. Prepare a plan for changes needed to be made before the next cycle. Document what you will move to and when. There are three responses to guide this. Adapt what has worked partially. Make revisions to make it better. Adopt uh, what worked well and consider expanding the changes to other areas or abandon it because it didn't work. Once you've seen, uh, once you've changed your approach, you can repeat the PDSA cycle with new ideas to see how that's worked out. And again, here is the last, um, here's what the analysis looks like. Since the workflow worked for two of the three positions, we will repeat the cycle for Clinic A for three additional months. Um, obviously, after meeting with um, Doc 3 to find out um, what the issues were and what was getting in the way of that Doc's workflow. We'll continue to vet the process map to determine gaps and opportunities for improvement and remeasure outcomes. And finally, you just repeat the cycle cycles until you get the results. That's, in a nutshell, what a PDSA cycle is for improvement. Um, again, this was just designed today to give you um, an overview of that. I guess we have five minutes left in the chat, and one of the things that I'd be curious to have you type in there is, would you benefit or tell me uh, or tell us if you felt that, like you would benefit from additional training on um, PDSA or improvement cycle kind of activity? So if you could just type that in the chat. And, Tommy, you want to move to the next slide, too? And we have about five minutes for questions here. So, and while we're while we're getting people into the chat, unless there are, are there someone there already? 
Nope. Okay. okay. Wonderful. So, um, so Candy, that was a great that was a great example, and you know, and I'm hoping that people while they were listening in the background um, were kind of putting your own little measures in there and kind of coming up with your own little plan to study act in the background because that's really why we you know did this so that you can think of what your measures are and what you would put in those fields. And these PDSA um, tools are, are available on uh, our LS. Uh, yep. are, um, are they available on the Alice Quinn website or on Stratus Health website? Um, you know, right now they're available on Stratus Health, but we'll get them transferred over to our Alice Quinn website as well. And if you keep going in the um, the resources, you can see, um, you know, our role as an Alice Quinn is to provide educational, technical assistance, um, try to get as many physicians and eligible clinicians engaged as possible, um, work on beneficiary engagement. Um, and here's just a few additional resources. I know Sarah's been entering in some resources while we've been talking. Um, here's our Lake Superior uh, LS Quinn homepage and the events page to look for this webinar and others. Um, there's the MIPS estimator uh, website, and there's the QPP benchmark table for 2017, and finally there's the Stratus Health Plan to Study Act worksheet. Um, but again, we'll move those over um, to um, keep those uh, on our LS Quinn website. And so here is um, each of our organizations have has its own help desk address. So if you're in one of these states and you have a further question on um, help on anything related to the quality payment program, here are here is both CMS's help desk as well as ours. And then finally, here are our contacts um, for the three states. Um, so, um, any, can you one further question in chat? Yep. Can you further explain the completeness calculation? So that's the data completeness that you, for claims, um, you need to have more than 50% of what you're reporting needs to come be from Medicare patients that you, you're seeing. So 50% in the, de 50, more than 50% of the denominators. More than, yes, more than 50% of the denominator, what you're reporting is the denominator and your performance is the numerator. But more than 50% of the denominator needs to come from Medicare claims for um, CMS, uh, for, from CMS, Medicare claims, Part B, for claims submission. And for all payers, for, for EHR, registry, and two CDRs, that needs to be more than 50% of all the patients you see across all payers. So let's say that you have one clinic that does not use an EHR, um, but you still see Medicare patients in that clinic um, or patients in that clinic if it's um, for all patients. And so you don't have data for that clinic. That clinic um, shouldn't exceed 50% of what you're providing. And so you need to have more than 50% of all the patients you're seeing um, under EHR, QCDR, or registry, um, and more than 50% of your Medicare patients under claims. Yep. Okay. And lastly, on the last slide, this is what the um, Quality Payment Program uh, website looks like. Um, as you can see, if you click on Education, well, there's... Some additional, oh, edu it's been updated. It's changed since. Yes, yeah, but, but basically, it, this is you get from the QPP website um, in the upper right hand corner. You'll see um, in the third box it says something about the, the MIPS program, and you hover over that and you'll see resources. Um, but obviously, here's where you check to see if you uh, exceed the low volume threshold as well. So um, just a reminder, when you close out, you'll be redirected to an evaluation. We would very much appreciate your input um, about this and uh, um, any other ideas that you have for future uh, webinars. So we, we value your input and feedback, and we look forward to um, helping you if you have further questions through our help desks in Michigan, Minnesota, and Wisconsin. Thank you, everybody, for your participation. Anything else in chat? Okay. Okay. Time is up. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This concludes today's conference. Thank you for participating. You may now disconnect.